Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, we are continuing our study on Judges chapter 14. And we had some points that we needed to, to finish up, which uh, Dwight was here for when we were discussing it, whether we can get all these things sort of sorted out here. I think it's going to take a little bit of time, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the studies that we have been having and um, for the light that has come. And we know, Lord, that there's still more work that lies ahead of us as far as understanding truth. And so we just pray that um, as we open up your word together, that your Holy Spirit will be here to instruct us, to correct us, to reprove us, and to strengthen us. We pray uh, for each person who has been studying these truths. Um, we pray that we can... Um, be united in our understanding of your word, that we can spend time together to study. And we know, Lord, that you are opening a, a way in this movement for this to happen. Help us to trust in you and to be with us now in this study, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, <clears throat> just a um, little bit of housekeeping note here regarding yesterday. So yesterday we had that first presentation on um, the study of the lines simply presented. Now, that, of course, was um, December 25th. Today is December 26th. Today is the 252nd uh, study of, of understanding the lines. And... We also have, um, yesterday was on the biblical calendar, what date? Does anybody know? The first day of the 10th month. Okay, so the first day of the 10th month comes into play where? Uh, in the book of Ezra. So in the book of Ezra, that's when they begin the divorce proceedings, right? Now we had... Uh, counted, so we know from the time that they begin these proceedings to the time that they end, in the literal sense, is 88 days, right? This occurs in a, over a period of 88 days, this divorce proceedings. And we had taken this and multiplied it by a prophetic month of 30 days, and we came up with the number 2,640, and we counted that from the end of Collins' prediction, which is uh, the end of January 11th, and we counted those numbers of days, and it brought us to April 5th, 2030, which we had already as a date. Now, it's interesting, if we took those three months as 90 days, and we used an actual lunar month, not a prophetic month, we would come to April 5th, 2030 as well, from yesterday. So if we count from the 10th day of the first month, three months, 90 days, and you multiply that by, um, so that's 90 times 29.530587, and that brings you to um, 2,657 and a quarter, three quarters of a day. So that rounds up to 2658. So if you were to count that many days, it'll bring you to April 5th, 2030, the first day of the first month. So it's just kind of an interesting footnote regarding um, that April 5th, 2030 date and its connection to this period of the divorcement. Now, so so yesterday we had that that first let's say we could say the divorce proceedings had begun to separate from the strange wives in that sense. Um, 
Now, we could sort of have a period of three days in which this kind of is occurring, you know, the 24th, the 25th, and, and even to some extent today with this being the 252nd uh, presentation. So it's just, just a few things to consider uh, regarding that chronology. So we know we have a lot of work ahead of us. <clears throat> now, on Thursday, does anybody remember what the discussion was we were having when we, we finished up uh, the meeting? Anybody remember the points that we were looking at? I think we were discussing about the honey and the, uh, the lion. Yeah, so we were dealing with the riddle, right? Um, so there was actually quite a few different points uh, that we were looking at. So we weren't sort of, we're kind of discussing a number of things. We had dealt with um, the significance of the 144,000. Um, so that was all addressed. So. You had begun to introduce the concept of that with the riddle. But we had gone back because mm -hmm. the, the conversation had been more that as the verse was showing, Samson and his parents were heading to Timnah. And he ripped this, this young lion apart. Mm -hmm. The... <laughs> the the situation because this was a, a new section of this book we had then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold a young lion roared in meeting him which is the alternate reading of course this was yes yesterday not Thursday but um, yeah, okay. so we had, yeah, so we had this. Um, so the vineyards of Timnath, Timnath. This would have to do with the doctrine, right? And then we have this young lion roaring. So this young lion roaring, we're, we're going to take as a message, right? That roars against uh, Samson. Roars in meeting him, yes. Yeah. Now he's going to kill this. And this is going to become part of this riddle because the bees are going to make um, uh, you know, whatever you call it. The carcass. Yeah, in the carcass, they're going to make this honeycomb. And so we, we can relate this, of course, to the message of FFA, FFA being uh, the bees, related to the bees because they're on Bumblebee Road. Um, so that's kind of where we were at. We were just trying to sort out some of this. So we're dealing with the riddle, but we're also going back to this story of where he's going down to Timnath and he kills this lion. Have you ever uh, connected it to a Revelation 10 when you, you have the lion that roareth? And we understand that's the, the sweetness, the honey for sweetness in the belly for the Millerites. And the, you have there the spirit of Samson, the spirit coming upon Samson. Maybe connecting that with the uh, glorious manifestation of the power of God. Okay, so, yeah, so if we're going to take what you're saying, if I understand it, so when we go to Revelation 10, right, verse 3, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, 
And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So this is Millerite history. Right? Yes. And we know that FFA it un, um, unfolds or unseals these seven thunders. Right? Because these begins, seven thunders begins to begins to okay but that that's the work of ffa i mean they don't understand that at first but later on we kind of come to understand that what's happening is that the history we are passing through is going to give us an understanding of millerite history that couldn't have been understood before that is after millerite history this this sealing up of the seven thunders was assumed by many just, you know, the disappointment. So once we understood the disappointment, we understood Millerite history, right? That's how Adventists who would even look at this would understand it. That's how I understood it before, right? Just reading Revelation 10 as a regular Adventist or conservative Adventist, I would see, okay, these seven thunders were unsealed after we understood the disappointment. We know that that's not the case because Millerite history wasn't really understood. It was this movement that, in its experience, that unsealed these thunders, correct? Yes. Okay. And this was happening progressively. That is, I mean, we first just tried to apply the seven thunders to the seven waymarks or seven events. And those kept changing. Right. As far as what, because as we saw more about Millerite history, uh, we would, because we didn't have, you know, Midnight in the Midnight Cry even first as waymarks as part of the Seven Thunders. They Then they started to unfold and we didn't really know what to do. And, and it, eventually it was just kind of, even though we never addressed the details of it, it was just kind of that those Seven Thunders must be Seven Waymarks. Um, that that just exists pro progressively in Millerite history. Um, but back in 2018, and, and even in 2017, this was being challenged by Peter Plum. And Peter Plum didn't like the Seven Thunders, the ways that it had been changing. And I wrote a paper on this, on, on this unsealing of the Seven Thunders, where I show quite clearly from what Ellen White says, that uh, the seven thunders, we, we wouldn't mark them as the waymarks in Millerite history. Um, it's just as we go through our history, those thunders are unsealed. And so the idea of just taking them as seven waymarks wasn't really, it was close to the right idea, but it wasn't exactly the right idea. Um, so I don't know if we should go into that right now, except we can say in this general sense that we can connect this honey, this eating of the little book, of course, is going to, because if you look at Revelation 10, it's starting here with this lion roar, roaring, and then it's going to be, and with this eating of the little book that's sweet in the, the mouth as honey, right? But it also makes the belly bitter. So there's this negative experience. So can we liken this riddle to, to the understanding of Millerite history that's in Revelation chapter 10? I guess that's the, the question that we, we need to answer here. Can we do this? Any, any thoughts on that? Mm. 
right? So remember this lion roars against him. So a young lion roared against him. And now this then is going to be what? If we take, if you connect it to Revelation 10, what is this young lion roaring about? would be it would be a prophetic message right but there would this be a warning to would this be a warning to the message of samson well i don't know because if if we're connecting this with revelation 10 because that's the question i asked because that's what stephen was was doing right and so when we look at this lion roaring and you look at it in revelation 10 um you know, the first context in which we would address this is we have this little book open. This is Millerite history, right? Agreed. And um, so this is a proclamation of the message in Millerite history. But then it would, if we're implying it to our history, it would be a repeat of this message. Right, so we can take this Millerite history and we can lay it over top of our history. So that message, the lion roaring, I mean, we know it's the line of the tribe of Judah that unseals the little book, right? That's chapter five of Revelation. So one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. So we have this book that needs to be opened. And when it's opened, right? So you see in verse 2, he had in his hand a little book open and set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So this is the seven thunders uttering their voices. This is Millerite history, right? But they're going to be sealed up. So then we're going to have these seven seals of this, this, this history. And that would be unsealed than in our history as we pass through the events we repeat millerite history these these seven thunders which is having to do with this little book the book of daniel specifically in one way though we know that this little book um this book that's sealed with seven seals I mean, in it, El Mike describes what it is. It's basically the pro whole prophetic counsel of the eternal, something to that effect. It's all of God's counsel written in symbolic language, which would be uh, prophecy. So the, so the question is, when we look at this riddle with this lion that has this honeycomb in it, it it's tying us directly here with these two symbols, the lion and the honeycomb, the honey, the sweetness of this message. So your, your comment was, Dwight, what was it again? What were you trying to say? It was a warning to this movement? Warning to this message that is, that is Samson. Okay, how would it be a warning to the message of July 18th? Not to set it aside. Okay. Wouldn't we look at this lion roaring, though, as the delivering of a message? It could be. Okay. Um, so if we have this message, 
that came from FFA. I mean, we know it's 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 a honey message, right? In the book of Samson. Or the book of Samson, the, the story of Samson. So I know we're jumping around a little bit to try to, to get this sort of settled, but this this line roaring roars against Samson, right? Right. Okay, so it says it roared against him. Or you had looked at the roared at his uh what was what was the word there that they used? <clears throat> encountering him right right so i wrote it at this encounter right so it's not i mean it says against him we just kind of think that it's opposed to him but when he comes upon this lion and he encounters him it's it's going to a, a roar at roar at this encountering or accidentally or friendly or hostile um encounter right <clears throat> okay <clears throat> So this message of Samson, this message which we're saying that is primarily understood as the message connected with July 18th, but it would encompass a lot more connected to the chronology as well, not just July 18th. And when this happens, the Spirit of the Lord comes mightily upon him. Now this rending of this lion... is uh, the word here, shasa, means to split or tear, figuratively to upbraid, uh, cleave, cloven, rend. Now, if we think of the idea of cleave, what would we think of there? Divide. Yeah, to divide something. So, so, this Samson, when encountered with this message, is going to divide it, right? So could we apply this to studying it, understanding it? Because this would be Millerite history, would it not? And does the message of July 18th give us a greater understanding of Millerite history than we ever had before. Yes. Especially in connection with Samuel Snow's letters. Right. So all of this is, and, and we think about a dividing of something. I mean, that's like a chiasm. So we have this understanding of this message that comes when Sam Samson goes down to Timnath. Now, of course, remember, this is morally ironic, um, this whole story, but it doesn't mean that the story is a complete mirror in the sense of everything is the opposite. It has to do only with the moral aspects of this story. So going down to Timnath, Timnath represents this um, this um, uh, mixture of protestant understanding of the scriptures apostate protestant understanding of the scriptures with adventist understanding is that how we would understand this because of the vineyards of timnath i would think so to the doctor so so we can see how this can apply on um on a level with this movement, because that's really what happens to this movement. Now, of course, remember the moral aspect, Samson's going down, he wants to, you know, marry a, a Philistine woman, but yet we can see that God is in this story. He's in this action. Now, we can also see that this is, we have connected this with 9-11. So we connected it with 9-11 in the sense that this um, occasion with the Philistines, which has to do with Samson's sexual desire, uh, but it would be applied in a sense, in an idolatrous sense. If we look at 
9-11 as spiritual formation. We can see that that's where this encounter occurs. That at 9-11, does the lion roar to this message? Does, does the roaring of the lion, does that happen at 9-11, I guess is the question that I'm asking. How could it not? Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> if we're looking at the message of FFA, if we're looking at Jeff's message, 9-11... Doesn't it sort of catch this movement off guard? Nine eleven catches them off guard because they're asleep. Right. So even though Jeff had been teaching this message, the first angel's message, when nine eleven happens, this movement isn't ready for it. It takes time to sort this out. And but so so if we're looking at Samson in this sense and we're looking at Samson as a message, it's a message that that has um, it's 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 received this inheritance from. From Jeff, right, from FFA, but it's a, it's a message that is in some ways separate but yet connected. I, I know we're not characterizing this well to, to try to understand it, but when we looked at chapter 13, we saw that Samson in the preamble to his birth, that we're covering the same, same history now. But there we could see clearly that this had to do with uh, the fact that this message that we have, this message of Samson, which has to do with Adventist history, with chronology. It, it sort of ties all these things together, but they come together in this specific message that's going to end up in the July 18, 2020 proclamation. And Jeff is quite clear about July 18 that it's the result of everything that had been studied. The reason why he accepted it is that everything came together. Every aspect of what he had experienced, what God had taught him, was now fulfilled in this July 18th date. But it's all connected to Millerite history and to this repeat of Millerite history. So then this riddle has to specifically relate to July 18, to the chronology. Just as we had in the first story, we had that relationship to the revealing of the name of Palmoni to the angel of the Lord. We can see that we have the same type of thing occurring. This is the same story, just with different a different illustration regarding Samson himself. Is that making sense to people, what we're discussing here? Because it, it's not well formed. Or, well, we're definitely not being eloquent here. Now, we also noted that he hadn't told his mother or his father about killing the lion. So that was one of the places where we, we were, were ending with. So we, we came to that conclusion. Now he's he also, what's that? He's uh, he's involved in like a marriage here as well, so that kind of connects with Millerite history. Right. So so we have the marriage. That's the symbol of the marriage. Um. Now here, of course, in this story, it's it's you know it's morally ironic. So some of these things we have to kind of think a little bit differently. But he's going to go down. He's He went down, talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. So she was straight in his eyes. And, and then after a time, he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see. 
So um, what does this mean? He returned to take her after a time. So it seems like he went down. He talked with her and then he's going to go another time. Is that what it's saying? When he sees this carcass of the lion. So this is going to be later. Now you're going to see that word shuv there that's returned. That word shows up lots of times. It can be translated as turn, return, restore. And it's and it's it's actually literally uh, with the day. So it says here after a time in the King James, but that word there is yom, which is normally a day. And this word here is just um, from a day he returned. So they're translating it as after a time, but literally it's the word day. So in this verse, in 14.8, mm -hmm. so we have the <clears throat> after a time. And of course, you know, we, we look at this. As, as we have in the past, after a yom. Yeah. So it's like after the the time when it is hot. So when the message was first being given after September 11, 2001, Wasn't there a period where this was very much a hot topic and then it began to cool down? I'm speaking about September 11, 2001. Yeah. So the question is, is that time that it's after, is that 9-11 that's being referred to? Right. So he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see the carcass, mm -hmm. the fall, or the decadence, or the ruin of the lion. Right. So in, in this, so if we take 9-11 as... Um, so I don't know about the hot part thing there, but definitely if we apply it to the day, that would be 9-11. From 9-11 onward, we see that he returns. Um, and uh, But we have this carcass of the lion. So this lion represents Millerite history, right? The first, second, and third angel's messages. Right, but I mean, when in in the consideration here, mm -hmm. Samson was devoted as a Nazarite, correct? Yeah. Now, as a Nazarite, he was not to enter into a covenant relationship with the nations around them. I mean, that's something that was incumbent upon all of the children of Israel. They were not to enter into a covenant with any of those around them. But he's looking to enter into this covenant with a Philistine. Yeah, but so that's the morally ironic part of it. Right, but the other part is that isn't it enjoined upon the Nazarites that they are not to touch a dead body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So in this manner, Samson is setting aside his Nazarite vow twice. Mm -hmm. No, and, and so when we look at this carcass of the lion, I right. mean, this, this would then be um, this church, right? I mean, you could apply it to Adventism, which has rejected Millerite history. But this swarm of bees. Now, the reason why they have the word bees, the, the root of this means orderly, uh, or orderly motion, because of the bees, it's a systematic in instincts, right? How the bee operates. The bees are not like flies that just are random. Bees have, you know, an order, a structure, right? Of, of how they work. They work together, just like ants do. And, and so this swarm is this idea of this congregation or assemblage of bees, which have this honey, they make this honey. And these are in the carcass of the lion. So if we look at um, this message, if we look at FFA, the school of the prophets, as this, this place, we can see that this came with the result of the Adventist church rejecting Millerite history and this examination of Millerite history. And it's Samson comes from this and, and he's going to be the one that's going to eat this honey, right? But he's going to share it as well. So he takes this honey in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and gave them. And they did eat, so he's going to share it. But he's not going to tell them uh, what had happened. So he didn't tell them where he got this honey from. It came from the carcass of the lion. But they don't know that he actually killed this lion either. Okay. Now, an odd thing that I'm looking at with this, with the the word bees. Yeah. <clears throat> From the Hebrew, how would we pronounce the Hebrew word? Uh, well, it's Deborah. So does this have an interrelationship with Deborah and Barak? Yeah, yeah, it's the same word. But the other odd thing, as I'm looking at the number, if you unscramble that in a specific manner, you would come to 1862. Yeah, you would. I don't know if that's, a, I don't know if I would do that. I don't know. I'm just I'm just noting something on. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the word sh shows up first in Deuteronomy one four four. Right. right. So we have it connected with uh, the hundred and forty four thousand there as a symbol. So ironically, how could we how could we approach this? And and it's also well, I don't know if we take that part around. So we take Samson's moral actions ironically it's okay. also mentioned in isaiah 7 18 so that would be the last place it's mentioned so the first time this word deborah is in the scriptures is deuteronomy 144 so that's 144,000 symbol and the last time it's mentioned is isaiah 7 verse 18 so again that is 187 well, that's July 18, yeah. <laughs> right. Directly. Okay. Um, so, so we have this word here that has this um, however we, we want to look at it. Um, these these symbols which which we relate to um, July 18th, the message of July 18th, as given by FFA. So this message is going to come from this carcass of the lion, the lion that roared, this young lion that roared against him or at his approach. So 
I mean, we still have all of these symbols, right? Even even without these numbers, I mean, we we can see that this story is is about this movement, about this message of July 18th. And and then when he takes it in his hands and he shares it, so he eats it, but he also shares it with his mother and his father. You know, his mother and his father represent, um, as as we understood it, because this is going to be Manoa. So this is, um, uh, you know, normally a father can represent the state and the mother represent the church. That's one way you could look at it. But in the context of this story, how did we understand father and mother? Like in chapter 13. I keep returning that they are the proper union, but there must be something more. Well, because because in chapter 13, we knew that um, Manoah, he's a man of Zora, right? Right. And that's going to be um, uh, Zora represents um, this hornet, right? So we already have that B symbol there and he's of the family of the Danites so that has to do with this judging but his name means from rest right so this is a repetition of Millerite history and this woman is bare so that would be the church right the church has been barren unfruitful yes unfruitful right but yet out of that is going to come this message, this message of Samson, this message of July 18th. It's morally ironic. So, you know, it's it's telling this story in a way that, you know, it's not good on the surface, but it's not about what's on the surface. It's about what's lying under the surface. So we just need to take the, the moral aspects and turn them around, but not all of the aspects, right? Because it's only only the moral part that's ironic so we can see the origins of this message that it's it's an establishment of adventism it's the fulfillment of revelation 10 in a repeat of history that is in the unsealing of these seven thunders right and then we're going to have this situation with this feast and these 30 companions. We also have the seven days of the feast. So we have all of these, these symbols. We're going to have the 30 changes of garment and also the 30 um, men that are going to have to be killed in order to provide those changes of garment, the, the men of uh, um, Ascalon, right, where he gets these 30 garments. And so we took that 30, 30, 30, and we could see that that related, because if we divided it by the 12 tribes of Israel, by the symbol of the covenant, that we get um, 25,252.5, which is a symbol of the seven, seven, seven days, right? So we, we've already divided them that way. So... <clears throat> So when we had started drawing this on a line, we took uh, this number 81, and that came from where? Where did we get the 81 from For to put in the center here? So we have the 81, and we have it um, as, as a center of a mirror. Where did we get 81 from in the story of Samson? Anybody remember? Uh, it's his name in geometric terms, backwards and forwards. Right. I mean, the so, value of the letters of his name. Yeah. So if you take Samson, and, and, and this is just a very rare occurrence, that you can take his name, which means sunlight, but you can take the, 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 
the way that we have it in scripture, just in English, Samson, his name frontwards and and so gematria, what we call reverse gematria, where Z is one, or just regular gematria, where A is one, it produces this 81 symbol. And remember, we went to, there's, there's lots of chapter 8 verse 1s that are significant, significant in this context. Uh, but the first one we would look at is where we deal with this mirror, and that's going to be in Isaiah 8 verse 1, right? With the story of uh, how you say his name, uh, um, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, right? And so there's going to take this great role, and this role means a mirror, right? So, so we have this mirror, and then here over on this side, I have written that. 30, 303,030 divided by 12 is 25,252.5 days. So this is the riddle on this side. And we know that there is um, this name not known and this name being known, so that there is this riddle. Um, so if I was going to do this here, I'm going to do it like this. <clears throat> So here we're going to have uh, the lion and the honey, right? So that's the riddle itself, correct? And the answer to the riddle has to do with this 30, 30, 30. So if we take the lion and the honey as the symbol of a riddle, that is in those symbols is tied up the message of the little book, right? that the message of the little book leads to this uh, conclusion. And, and we, what we could do with this is, is just say that this, um, I'll do it this way. Just uh, So can we say that this line in the honey provides this answer, the 777 days of our structure? And since we have 9-11 over here, uh, we would put the lion roaring here so you know maybe we can put these as specific dates somehow or way marks Does so it make sense what I'm doing here with this this line? Does it make sense we have the line roaring at 9-11? I think it's logical. But it's also 11-9, right? But that also applies. Right. Okay. And so we have July 18th there. And so in this history, we have this line and this honey, this riddle. Um, but it's going to be unlocked with this 777-day structure. So, so there's something about our history that answers to Millerite history. And, and we know that the line is going to be rent, right? So, so I'm putting the line in the honey as uh, prior to July 18th, because Samson is going to see the line in the honey. He knows the answer to the riddle, but that answer to the riddle is not understood 
except by Samson himself. And Samson, of course, is a message, right? So this is a message that's developed. You know, which is Samson, right? Now, July 18 passes. So, so where would we put July 18? Like, if we're going to market it with these verses that we're studying, is there any specific point in... Any specific point here that we can mark as July 18? Right? So we know that he's going to eat this honey. He's going to share it. So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast for so used the young men to do, and it came to pass when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, if you can certainly declare it with me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. So this 30 shirts actually here and 30 changes of garments. So it's kind of divided in this way. So when he gives the riddle, it's going to be in 14.4. And he said unto them, out of the eater came forth meat and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days, expound the riddle. So would we take Judges 14, 14 and place this at the center of the chiasm? That that is when the riddle is presented. You understand what I'm asking? I'm considering what you're asking. Okay. Because I'm saying that when the lion roars in um, there's, there's judges, that's going to be 14.5. But, it, it, but it's all part of this... Um, This history for after 9-11. So that's you know it's gonna start at verse 14, verse 4. Um, but we're gonna have this lion roar. Maybe we could put that in, in a way mark. Uh, I mean, we're connecting it with 9-11, but also 11-9. But as you're as you're going through this, I'm also having to recall um, a presentation that Elder Jeff had done that was specific to the number 81. Okay. Because he was making the point that when Mrs. White was 81, wasn't it that that was the last general conference session that she she attended? Yeah. I believe that's uh, correct. So, there was there was something about that that was that was very pointed about this with eighty one. So I'm just I'm not. I'm not setting aside your, your question about the lion roaring. I'm just trying to combine these two to see exactly if there's something that supports these points even more fully. Yeah. Well, the thing about the 81 is this comes from 81 priests. 
like the 80 priests and the high priest is where um, this story comes from, primarily the symbol. Um, So that is in um, uh, Second Chronicles twenty six. Yeah, Second Chronicles. Yeah, so that's going to be with Uzziah, right? And what's the so as a ride with him four score priests um, <clears throat> right so this had to do with Uzziah offering incense so the 81 represent the priests so so the question is, why did Jeff consider uh, Ellen White being 81? What was the significance of that? Why, why was he noting it? Because 1909 was our last GC. Yeah, yeah, I know that. So 1909 is the last general conference. I thought it had something to do with a period of judgment. I just have to go back and find it. We have the priests, Levites, and the necronyms symbolized in that their account, 1909. Okay. Um it's also where she says that the general conference is not the voice of God, um, or I think, um, I'm just trying to read here what these guys are saying. So I think that was actually earlier. Um, she said that earlier. So I'm trying to figure this out. Um, I mean, she pointed them to the Bible with her last words at the general conference. I recommend this book to you. Okay, she says, um, General Conference Bulletin, May 31st, 1909. At times when a small group of men entrusted with the general management of the work have, in the name of the General Conference, sought, sought to carry out unwise plans and restrict God's work, I have said that I no longer regard the voice of the General Conference, represented by these few men, as the voice of God. This is not saying that the decisions of the General Conference composed of an assembly of duly appointed representative men from all parts of the field should not be respected. God has ordained that the representatives of his church from all parts of the earth, when assembled in General Conference, shall have authority. The error that some are in danger of committing is giving to the mind and judgment of one man or of a small group of men the full measure of authority and influence that God has vested in his church. In the judgment and voice of the general conference assembled to plan for the prosperity and advancement of his work. Um, so anyway, that's one thing she said in 1909 at the general conference.
So, so I'm not sure why Jeff particularly saw, saw significance in that, um, but he already had the symbol of 81 for it to mean anything. I mean, it's not like he got the symbol of 81 from Ellen White being 81 in 1909. So he got the symbol from Second Chronicles 2620. Now, Stephen, you were saying about the priest, Levites, and Ethanim. Um, I didn't quite understand what you meant. Connected with the, the, the account, it was actually Permender who introduced that 81 in December 2016. And he was relating a story of Ellen White. And it's, when it's mentioned that she's 81, it's connected to some, I think some person who uh, was inside the tent. And he, uh, there was like, there was two groups inside the tent. I think he could hear Ellen White speaking. So he, he heard her, he was close up. So that was representing like the priests, those both one group. And then he went to the back of the tent and he could still hear Ellen White. I think that was like uh, representing the Levites. And then he went outside the tent, and I think there was people outside the tent as well, and they, they could still hear Ellen White speaking. So that was representing those outside the tent, but the, outside the church in a sense, but listening into the message, maybe representing the Nephilims. Yeah, so I don't know if I would connect that with the priest Levites and Nephilims as symbols. I mean, I've, I've never liked the priest Levites and Nephilim uh, applications that that we've made so so you're not going to get much uh, in my mind from that um, I'm not saying that that doesn't apply that they don't apply but you know the way Parminder would use them I, I would be pretty suspect but yeah so the idea is that that he could hear Alan White clearly in all these three locations whether up front, whether in the back, or whether outside the tent. And that was in 1909? Yes. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? I'm just going to have to go a little a little deeper and dig a little bit more to see what else I come out with. Yeah, I, I mean, because we have 81 representing the priests. That is, 81 represents the, uh, well, we have the high priest and 80 priests, right? That's the idea in the story in Second Chronicles 26. Now, I understood that 81 represents midnight as well, though I've never fully understood that. Why? How Jeff made that? I've heard him say that. But if we're going to say that this is the message of July 18th, it's the message of Samson that this 81 is. And that it is a rebuke to a mixture of church and state. You know, how do we relate that to the story of Samson particularly? Yeah, because when I look at the 81, Ellen White being 81 in 1909, that's not a primary argument. That's maybe a tertiary support for something else. Uh, just like when we say, you know, there's 46 chromosomes in the human genome. That's not a primary argument. You know, we relate it to the 46 years, but we don't come up with 
the 46 years from looking at the, the human genome. You know, this is the time of the building of the temple, right? So, so we first get the 46 years, then we have the building of the temple, and then we take this tertiary argument, well, our body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, and we have 46 uh, chromosomes. So, but you would never start with that. And that's, that's the way I look at Ellen White being 81 in 1909, is it's, it's something that's mentioned after we have already built up this significance of the number 81. The number 81 doesn't derive its significance from Ellen White's age at, at the last general conference. It's a symbol that's already established. And it's supposed to be a symbol for midnight, my understanding, but I'm not sure how we derive that. I just know that it first comes from Second Chronicles 16. <coughs> So my understanding is, is that's when 81 became significant. And it was afterwards found that the priests were 80 plus the high priests connected with that. That was like a found secondary. Now, okay. it may, be, yeah. may have been there initially, but wasn't really. Okay. So you're saying that they just took Ellen White's age at 81 at the Hall General Conference and made that a symbol? So um, I don't know if that's actually true. I was reading something that was titled 81 July 1.pdf. Not exactly sure who wrote this or when it came out. But one of the things I noticed was uh, Ezekiel 81, Psalms 81, Desire of Ages, Chapter 81. All these things had been highlighted. Um, this is just a, a one of the one of the documents that I have that says 81 July 1st. So I didn't read everything through it, but I was scanning it, and one of those things just jumped out at me. Okay, so but you don't know, and it was titled July 1st. I'm there's so many different there's a so as I was going through this. Uh, it looks to be notes to a class. Um, it's it's talking about the parable of Adventism, and it says 2,000 with a question mark. Uh, then it says the midnight I cry. I have this document. You should have this document. Yeah. So this is... Um... It, it also has foundations laid 2001 through 2014 in it. It's, it's made by Jeff. And um, it looks like it was made on uh, in 2017. Um, seven nine, so that would be July 9th, or is that September 7th? Uh, <laughs> when when they use the document property, September 7th. Um, September 7th. So they go day, month, year. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. Um, Well, I'm just going to look at another document and see what they do. How they do these dates. Okay. So I remember that uh, when Parmenter presented that about the 81, it was then sort of thing, and is that significant? And then they found that uh, two Chronicles, 26 and so forth after that. Yeah, well, definitely Parmenter isn't the one who came up with the 81. Yeah, so it's actually going to be July 9th is the way that that, that document was created. So. July 9th, 2017. Um, now this is, 
Okay, so these are the stones. Now, I remember this series on the stones was um, Parminder did this series about the stones. I or, or he first introduced the stones. But I think this is Jeff presenting these things. So these are his main presentations, the prophetic pattern, uh, Daniel 11, the purif purification of God's church, the crowning act, Gideon's torch. So they're, they're taking these as these stones that were laid from 1989 through to 2001. <clears throat> and then they're going to take here, I'll just show you the document that we're talking about here. So this document was made in 2017. And then they're going to have the stones and then the foundations that were laid. They're going to have ozone in 2004. They have December 2005 was the 2520. Um, the number 46 in 2006. Um, the... Ozone camp meeting in 2007, the two, two tables, Waymarks Foundation, 2008 in London, Judgment of the Living at 9 11, 2008, Yorkton Bay, uh, Lateran, a message, Seventh Seal, Oklahoma, the prophetic chain in 2010, which is the first one I was at, uh, the desolation of Jerusalem in 2011, the covenant lines in 2011, and Habakkuk's tables in 2012 the 95 theses idea. And then the hidden manna in 2014. Um, and then behold, the bridegroom cometh. That's going to be in 2014, 2015, November to January. I was at the behold, the bridegroom cometh camp meeting in 2014. Then they had the walls of the vineyard, um, most holy place open December 16 uh, December 2016 in Wales the seven seals begins to open and and so these are Jeff's notes so he's going back and referring to something that was actually first presented by Parminder and then he's going to have these uh, spirit of prophecy statements so I mean if we found his presentation we might understand more about it so so these are notes to a presentation in 2017. So in here, they're going to mention the last thing, May 2nd, 1844, Ezekiel 1, Psalm 81, Desire of Ages, Chapter 81. That's what you're referring to, the 81 there. I'm sorry, down at the bottom, is that what that is? Yeah. So um, what got me on to this was yesterday I was uh, going through some notes. Uh, well, actually, I was doing a, a search for some things. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I came across was a, I believe it was a video that was titled 81. And I'm, I'm just not able to find it right now. It was something that Jeff did. Okay. It was, uh, I, I just don't know where it is. Okay. Yeah, and they're, they're mentioning here um, May 2nd, 1844. So this is the prediction before midnight. That was the date that um, uh, Blessings had arrived at, that Tabo was promoting for um, this prediction before midnight idea. That's why that's there. You're going to have the general conference session in 1909 listed up there. So he's obviously going to talk about Ellen White. 1981 and 1909 but yeah i don't know if we could say that he would have just taken because i can't imagine and i could be wrong but i can't imagine that he's just going to note ellen white's age in 1909 and just have this 81 as a symbol unless he's got it somewhere else first and it could be ezekiel 8 one right so I found it. It's okay. uh, oh no, I'm sorry. No, I didn't. I thought it was. 
Habakkuk, Habakkuk's Two Tables, 81, Part 8. So I'm assuming that's in the 95 or, yeah. you know, he, he had them at series. Yeah. Yeah. So well, some might he got there. the symbol 81. I, I just don't think he would have got it unless he, he sort of worked back. He saw that she was 81 in 1908 or 1909, pardon me. And then, and then just started working. Well, is that significance in finding these other 81s? But that's, me, how it that's how it happened. That's how it happened. You're certain? That's yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's the way I remembered it anyway. Okay. Just seems kind of an odd way to to see something, but but it is possible. So if he saw 81 first, that she was 81, um, then he would take that symbol and work its way backwards to see what the significance of it was. So he kind of reverse engineered it in that sense. Because <coughs> initially when it came up, it was like 81, okay, is that significant? And then things just began to open up concerning 81 after that. Yeah. So it was reverse engineered. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Which is kind of interesting, you know, um, that, that Jeff would do that. At but if this is in like 2017 or is this earlier? Well, that was first uh, an issue that uh, a symbol that first came to light December 2016. So okay. just after Tavo done his, uh, or not Tavo, Charity opened up Daniel 11. So it was just like a week or so after that. Okay. So, okay. So that kind of makes sense. Um, now, I know he didn't present it in 2017 in Alberta. Uh, at least I'm, I don't remember him presenting it, um, but that would have been about that time. He, but I could look back at those meetings and see if he did anything with it then. Um, so, so anyway, we have the symbol of eighty-one, <clears throat> and we relate it to the message of Samson. So, if it's going to be connected with uh, what happens after Chawatu presents his study on Daniel eleven. And it's going to be connected with all of this about P Panium and Raphia. We could then see how it's connected with um, this structure here. So that means the message of Samson has to be connected with what we eventually find is November 9th and July 18. That 777 structure. So can we say then that this message of Samson is, so that's what we're trying to establish here in this study this morning, that the message of Samson is the message of the 777 days and that it has its inheritance in this other history of Adventism. And, and I think that that would be an easy thing to establish. Right. That is, we already would understand it that way. But this this helps us to understand it further. <clears throat> any any thoughts on this? We just got a few minutes left. I would think that we could more fully establish this in our next session. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're going to have to do tomorrow. Um, but we can see that this riddle, you know, as we understand this riddle further, as we understand uh, the significance of the lion and the honey, that they connect us to this message. But it's, it's producing a riddle in our time in connection with July 18th. But the answer to that riddle doesn't happen on July 18th. Right, that's going to happen after July 18th. After the, actually after the whole 777 structure is completed. 
which is what we've already understood. Um, <clears throat> observation. Okay. Um, does anybody else think it's kind of weird that we're we're going through a a riddle? What think it's weird that we're going through? Well, um, no, I think that it's kind of weird that you know it seems as though we've discovered this riddle, and there's a little bit of a contest as to what another riddle means. You're talking about the riddle in um, mm -hmm. in Revelation chapter um, seventeen. Yeah. Yeah, the riddle that's been so predominant here the last one year. Yeah, yeah. So, so we understand the significance of this, right? In Revelation um, seventeen, we have this this riddle, this mystery. But as it's unraveled, I had to mute you there, Ron. You're too noisy. So it it unravels in connection with our understanding of what we went through. So we went through uh, examining the foundation and now understanding the lines. And so that riddle, um, that answer to that riddle is still unfolding just as the answer to this riddle is. But this is Palmoni that gives us the answer, right? That's what we can see. We can see that from chapter 13 of Judges, and we can see that from chapter 14 of Judges. I just, I just thought it was kind of interesting that uh, uh, two groups have different views of these things. I, 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 I was listening to um, Jeff the other day on 1886 and 1888. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he made a comment on, which that 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 <laughs> that really smacked me in the face was half right and half wrong is a symbol. And that symbol applies to this movement as well as the Adventist uh, and as well as the Millerites. I thought that was I thought that was kind of interesting mm -hmm. how he put that and and. <laughs> I don't know why I see these things when I do, but you know, this is actually what kind of got me over to the 81. Okay. Uh, Cause one, one of the things was, uh, uh, I had spotted that 81 during that search or during that uh, time that I was listening to that stuff. So just to clarify that. So the half right, half wrong is, um, uh, Tess was saying that Jeff was half right and half wrong. And, but he says it's a symbol. So, yeah, Jeff was saying it's a symbol. Yeah. Which, which and he mean? applied it He applied it to the movement uh, prior to um, July 18th. Yeah. Was it, was it not that uh, Jeff was applying something to uh, Perminder about him being half right and half wrong and then... Uh, Correct. Tess Tess went ballistic? Well, I, I don't know about uh, Tess. She wasn't actually even mentioned very yeah. much in that particular presentation. It was yeah. all about Param, uh, Parminder and yeah. I believe it was Bates or yeah. one of the others. Yeah. Yeah. He was comparing um, half right, half wrong, and he was, he was given the examples that in uh, Adventism, M Millerism, and then our... Um, at that time, uh, the FFA. Yeah, it, it was sort of an epithet that was being thrown around it, it, to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't remember exactly how that happened. I think Stephen might be correct that it was first Jeff that mentioned it. Tess then threw it back at Jeff. Um, so it might be something we want to look into. Well, but I mean, I, the, the, the reason I... It, it, uh, it stuck with me was it was the how he was presented it wasn't he wasn't like saying it was this bad thing it was just how God was showing us things 
as we as we moved along, we discovered that um, well, what he was saying was actually wrong, and uh, so he's half right, but he was half wrong. And his premise, his whole premise was uh, half right, half right, all wrong. Wasn't that something was, to do with 2014? I'm sorry, was that it, was what? Was it not to do with Parmenter's prediction about 2014? I believe that that's what it was. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. I, what I noticed was that he had, he had noticed it uh, throughout the movements movements yeah okay anyway we have to end so so let's close with prayer <clears throat> dear father in heaven thank you for the study this morning we ask that we can come back to this tomorrow and that you can help us in the interim to contemplate these things uh, to study some of these details out so that we can bring them together um, we know, Lord, that we need to be corrected, um, that without you, um, all of our thinking, all of our understanding means nothing. And so we ask you into our lives throughout this day that you can speak to us. Be with each person who is studying these things. Uh, continue to guide and direct us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.